Hello and welcome back from the intermission. Uh, so, as has been stated, the second half of this evening will be the more hopeful and uh, happy half. So, if, if you were here before and you got bummed and you were drinking too much because you were bummed, now we're going to remedy that. Um, I can't be quite as long-winded about the next speaker as I was about Patrick uh, because She's always been someone who's been on the periphery of, of, uh, of my circles. And I always just hear talk of her as being this legendary sage. <laughs> um, so when Patrick said, I'm going to give a lecture, and uh, Olivia's going to do the other lecture, I was just, sure, of course, yes, I'm thankful to have her. Um, and this is a topic that also has always been something I've been interested about and just not read more about because I got distracted by bats and skulls and such. Uh, so I'm very excited to get more information about this topic. Uh, and here to bring it to us is Olivia. stuff out of this box I brought. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about my favorite thing to talk about, which is herbal medicine. And I brought some little samples of things for people to look at, um, and I'm going to show lots of pictures. So afterwards, if people want to come up and look at these things, um, please feel free. And I also need to leave some room here because I'm going to do a demonstration. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So also another uh, note about this lecture is that I was going to show this little YouTube video about the immune system at a cellular level because it's very complicated and I was like, I'll just skip that part and let somebody else do it. Um, but we can't get the sound up, so I'm going to have to wing it. <laughs> um, so, thank you so much for coming and listening to me talk, and thank you Connor and Yellow Sign Theater for having us, and this is really wonderful. And thank you Patrick, wherever you are, where are you, Patrick? He's getting a crepe and he'll be okay. uh, so I think it's really inspiring whenever I meet somebody who studies very depressing things, because <clears throat> I used to be an activist. And I used to read a lot of depressing stuff, and then finally one day I said, I want to be an herbalist. I can't do this anymore. This is just too depressing. So I really have a deep respect for people who keep studying and working with the sad things, because we need them too. I have chosen, though, to shift my focus of my life and study the things that make me really happy, and that is herbal medicine. So just really quickly, um, I was actually in a situation about eight years ago where I was having reoccurring fungal infections and I kept going to Western doctors and they kept telling me, well, here's an antifungal and this is all we can do. And finally, I became resistant to that antifungal and I was just getting them every month and it was awful. And I was like, there's gotta be something else out there. Like this can't be it. You know, this can't be the rest of my life. And that is actually how I discovered herbal medicine. There was a book about herbs on a friend's desk, and I picked it up, and I looked up the thing that was going on for me, and it was in there, and there was like 12 different herbs listed. So um, this is very exciting. If, if this is any of your first time being exposed to the power of herbal medicine, I rejoice in that. Okay. So, you're like, I'm kind of staring over this thing. So the title of this lecture uh, is A Complementary Slash Alternative Treatment Approach to Antibiotic Resistant Infection. And I'm going to start tonight just by giving you a summary of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to do just a brief overview of basically what Patrick started off uh, of the antibiotic resistant bacteria. I'm going to do a discussion of how our natural defense systems prevent these things from occurring. And then I'm going to talk about plants that are both antimicrobial, but also
also plants that are immune modulating and plants that um, basically help us improve our natural defenses and thus prevent from even getting these infections in the first place. And then I'm going to do a little medicine making demo and have time for Q&A. So hopefully I'll be able to make it through all of this. Okay, so as, so as Patrick said, uh, we have these most common superbugs. We've got MRSA, we've got VRE, which is enterococcus, VRSP, which is streptococcus, uh, pneumonia that's resistant to penicillin. We've got E. coli um, that's resistant to antibiotics. And then we've got C. diff, which is really on the rise right now. And that's a scary one. Um, so this is also a scary one. This is a picture of MRSA. Um, you would know that you might have MRSA if you had something that looked like this and it was oozing. Um, contraction signs and symptoms. So mostly they're, the bacteria is entering through like a small cut or a large cut if you go into a hospital and you're having a surgical procedure done. Um, it's gonna get in through the eyes, the genitals, the mouth, or the nose. The first signs could be cellulitis of boil, which is just basically a hair follicle size um, filled with pus. An abscess, which is a larger boil, also filled with pus. A sty, which commonly happen on the eyes. Um, or a rash, or carbuncles. <laughs> which I think happen on your feet. Does anybody know? Oh. Carbuncles? Anybody ever have one? No? Okay. Um, so you basically know that you need medical attention if you have something that looks like the slide I just showed you anywhere on your body, but then you also have fever, chills, low blood pressure, which you would know as extreme fatigue, joint pain, shortness of breath, or if your flesh is being eaten away. <laughs> <laughs> so VRE, um, this, this is an enterococcus species resistant to the antibiotic vancomycin. This bacteria exists in our body. So does staph, like Patrick said. Like most of us have staph in our nose. This one exists mainly in our guts. Um, it, the resistant strain comes from hospitals in which people are in close quarters and on tons of antibiotics, and therefore it mutates into a worse version of itself. Um, it causes meningitis, which is inflammation of the brain meninges or the spinal cord meninges. Uh, the, pneumonia, and then infection of the heart, which is endocarditis. Um, then there's also uh, strep. So th this causes pneumonia and bacterial meningitis. It's a gram-positive bacteria. Um, and it basically exists in our lungs normally. Then there's E. coli. E. coli uh, can, can, uh, can Normally found in our lower intestines, constituting 1% of our gut flora, it's gram negative, and healthy strains actually produce vitamin K for us. So this is actually a bacteria that does something health positive in our bodies on a daily basis. Um, virulent strains can lead to gastroenteritis, really bad urinary tract infections, neonatal meningitis, infant meningitis, uh, and pneumonia. Okay, so if all of these things are not only in our environment, but they're actually existing in our bodies, why aren't we all dead? It's actually because we have an amazing immune system. When I started herbal medicine school, I thought I was gonna be really jazzed about my Materia Medica classes, and the thing that I got most jazzed about was healthy physiology. The body is friggin' amazing, okay? Like if you ever wanna get happy, Study healthy physiology. It's just miraculous. Okay, so the immune system is really about where the outside meets the inside. So to start off with and in explaining this, you've got your skin, which is your most exterior barrier between the outside world. You've got your gut, which is actually your inside skin. Because every time you swallow something, it's not exactly inside of your body yet. It has to pass through the lumen of your gut before it's in contact with your blood and your lymph and your other organs. Um, so 
If you ironed out your gut skin, it would be the size of a football field. <laughs> and actually, that's just your small intestine. That's not even your stomach or your large intestine. So this is a huge surface area. Then you have your urinary misspelling, sorry about that, and your genital organs. So all of these things, and then you also have like your eye openings and your mouth. So you know you have basically this barrier and these openings for things to pass out of you and for things to be absorbed into you. And all of it is covered by bacteria, which is keeping you healthy. And then it's also in close contact with immune cells. So our bodies are constantly basically doing this balancing act called homeostasis. Um, there's many examples of this. This is a, a picture that I really love because it shows the balance between Th1 cells and Th2 cells. So T cells are, are a type of white blood cell, which is primary cell of your immune system. And as you can see here, and there's you know, many different kinds of T cells, so the T helper cell one and T helper cell two, in normal balance, you, you, know, you have an equal ratio of them. In autoimmune disease, you have more Th1 cells, and I'm sorry, more Th2 cells and less Th1 cells. Uh, and then in cancer, it's reversed. And then immune modulation, which we're going to talk about further, herbs that actually do this, they balance your Th1 and Th2 cells. Um, or, you know, bring you back in balance there. Okay, so it's not just about your barriers, but it's also about your internal lymphatic system and immune system. Uh, and don't worry, I'm going to get to the really uh, juicy stuff soon. But I just want to give you a clear picture of what's happening because it'll make the herb stuff more amazing. So I don't know if anyone has had anatomy physiology or if you know that much about your lymphatic system, but this is a picture of your lymph nodes in your body. And what you'll notice here is that there's a, a big amount of stuff going on right here. What do you think this is all surrounding? Your guts. Because you have that huge skin that's being exposed to tons of bacteria and toxins all the time. So it makes sense that you would have a huge amount of lymphoid tissue, and the lymphoid tissue is holding big groupings of white blood cells that then attack and kill the pathogens surrounding your guts. You actually have a whole lymphatic system surrounding your guts that hardly ever gets talked about. It's called your gastric, it's the gastric lymphatic tissue. It's abbreviated to GALT. Um, so we study that a lot in herbal medicine because we understand how important it is to basically heal the gut in any type of um, care. You want healthy gut functioning because that is kind of the beginning to all other disease. Um, so your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, your intestine, your gallbladder, your urinary bladder, your lymph nodes, and spleen are all actually working together to create this constant homeostasis. And then I was going to show you a video about white blood cells, but we can't do that. Um, it's okay because you can always watch it later. If you want to, if you want to watch a YouTube, great YouTube video, there are these things called handwritten tutorials, and you can just do immune system handwritten tutorials on YouTube, and it's really awesome. Um, so what I'm actually going to focus on today, any questions about the immune system? Do people feel like they have kind of a somewhat grasp of like what's going on? You've got white blood cells, they're attacking pathogens, they're in your lymph vessels, surrounding your gut and other places. Okay. So the difference in healing strategies between Western and modern medicine and herbal medicine is that Western medicine, as Patrick discussed, really focuses on looking at a bacteria in a petri dish and giving it an antibiotic and then seeing if it kills it. Whereas herbal medicine is really 
holistic medicine, it looks at the whole body. How are whole plants affecting a whole body? Which is much more complicated, and you can't really like uh, do a research study where you control all the variables. So this is one of the reasons why it's hard for modern Western science to mesh with more traditional healing modalities because they have these very different two outlooks on things from the get-go. Whereas herbal medicine or holistic care focuses on using uh, our resources of antimicrobials, which are actually killing the bacteria, but they're also making the environment of our bodies, especially those mucosal linings, uh, much less inhabitable to the bacteria. These include probiotics, prebiotics, demulsants, astringents, and bitters. And those are those words are just like groupings of herbs, basically. It like describes an action of an herb. And then we also focus on enhancing natural defenses. So this is immune modulators, immune stimulants, and diaphoretics. Um, and then we also focus on helping the body to heal. So this is like wound care, um, do, you know, we use vulnerabilities, anti-inflammatories, and I'm going to give examples of these things. Okay. So there is some research happening right now on antimicrobials. One of the reasons why there's not more um, is because you can't patent something that naturally occurs. So that means you can't sell it and make money off of it in the way that you can with penicillin. Um, even though penicillin was discovered by mold on bread, which naturally occurred. But somehow they were able to take that one specific antibiotic and, and make it in a laboratory and then patent it. So these are all whole plants that contain phytochemicals that then people do research on and then they build drugs off of those single plant chemicals or they try to mimic the action of the plant. So actually most of our drugs come from things that naturally occur but somehow they've like made it into a singular thing so that then they can patent it and sell it. Um, so when we looked at the antibiotic resistant infections I don't know if any of you noticed, but they basically surround infecting the areas of our body that are, um, you know, the places where our bodies are meeting the world. So this is our respiratory tract, it's our digestive organs, um, our urinary system, and then also our skin. So we have different herbs that kind of relate more with different systems. Anybody notice anything about most of the plants that are listed under digestive system? Delicious. <laughs> yeah. They're usually in food. Do you think that there's a reason why those plants made it into our common kitchen herbs? Well, it's because we've only had refrigerators for about 60 years. So, um, in, before refrigeration, people use things like fermentation and also herbs to decrease the microbial load or the chance of getting infection from microbes by just putting it into your food. That's pretty smart. <laughs> um, respiratory system, you'll notice with these, they're usually plants that are very high in volatile oils which are the things that you smell, like when you make a tea, a rosemary tea or a mint tea, and you can really smell that aroma. Those are the volatile oils being released from that plant, and then they're hitting your nose. So um, you can use essential oils as steams. So just by like dropping one or two drops of an essential oil in a bowl of steaming water and then putting a towel over your head and breathing those in, will actually give you like a topical respiratory cure for pneumonia, basically. So um, urinary system, we have uva ursi. I don't know if anyone's taken uva ursi. It's a very common herb that's given for your UTIs. 
And then um, cranberry. Cranberry is actually the number one herbal medicine seller, like number one in the U in the U.S. More money is made by cranberry supplements than any other natural remedy. Um, and blueberry, juniper, buchu. Juniper is the berry that's made in that's used in gin. Um, and then skin, we have chamomile, calendula, propolis, which is actually the uh, resin that bees make and they put on the doors to their hives and it's actually their way of protecting the hive from bacterial infection. Um, myrrh and then tea tree oil. Let's talk about oregano oil. Okay, oregano. It grows like a weed, it's in the mint family. Probably anybody who's ever had a garden has grown oregano. Uh, this is oregano vulgar. This is, you know, there's many species of oregano. This oil, uh, just a few drops of it taken internally or applied topically, uh, is, is actually has been studied and, and is found to eradicate MRSA. So this is a study that's already been done. Um, a microbiologist who was part of that study said, preliminary tests show that oregano oil is very effective against MRSA in really low doses. And then when I looked it up, oregano on Jim Duke's uh, database, there's 38 different phytochemicals from that one plant that have proven antibacterial effects. So you're not just getting like one phytochemical that can kill MRSA. You're getting 38 that are working together in a synergistic fashion to kill MRSA. And this is why herbal medicine is amazing. <laughs> Okay, fennel, another uh, plant that's commonly put in food, has kind of a sweet taste. It comes in second as a, the plant that has the largest number of proven phytochemicals to show antibacterial action. I think it's like 32. Thyme, a wonderful plant. Um, so this is a very potent antimicrobial. As I mentioned earlier, thyme essential oil is uh, stronger than bleach and you just need a couple of drops. So you could add a couple of drops of thyme essential oil into your natural cleaning products like vinegar, um, and that's gonna be a really great solution for cleaning your kitchen or your bathroom. Um, I think some people have already tried to do some studies around incorporating thyme oil in hospitals um, because bleach is and an other like alcohol-based antimicrobial products you know, are leading to this problem of resistance, whereas they're not finding that to be true with these more natural things. So there was a study done, um, they did 120 different strains of bacteria isolated from patients with infections in the oral cavity, the respiratory, gen gentourinary tracts, and then the results of the experiment show that the oil from time exhibited extremely, extremely strong activity against all clinical strains, even the antibiotic resistant strains. Garlic. Garlic is one of my all-time favorite plant medicines. Um, you can grow it also very easily, just like thyme, oregano, and fennel. Uh, it has the broadest spectrum of antimicrobial property of any substance known to human beings. Um, it is also immune tonifying and cardiovascular protective. It's best eaten raw or crushed. Uh, a quote from Paul Bergner, who is another herbalist, said garlic is effective against specific bacteria that are notorious for developing resistant strains, such as Staphylococcus, Mycobacterium, Salmonella, and species of Proteus. Okay, I'm going to talk just about a couple of plants that I actually didn't study in school, but I discovered in doing the research for this. This is Biden's Pelosa, uh, traditionally used as an antimicrobial, particularly in cases when the mucosa is inflamed and irritated, the whole plant is used. Um, this is a plant native to Africa and South America, but now grows like a weed in the U.S. Um, and it's proving to be a strong systematic antibacterial. So this is a weed, like in places where they're still doing um, like cotton farming, cotton agriculture, this is a huge problem. 
it's also a huge solution. So, <laughs> you know, it's like when I read this stuff, I'm just like, what's going on? You know, it's like we have this huge problem with anti antibacterial resistance, and then we're probably like poisoning all the Biden's pelosa in Maryland because it's a weed, and we're you know feeding it pesticides. Okay, uh, this is one that I just learned about a uh, native to Ghana, and. I just think it's a really um, beautiful plant. I don't know if you can see it, but it has this amazing spiral, spirally flower head before it opens, and then once it opens, the petals kind of spiral too. And it actually made me think about uh, Lyme disease when I, when I saw the picture, because there's this thing called the doctrine of signatures in herbalism, which means that if you look at a plant, it can actually tell you just by the way of its appearance, what it can be used for. Um, and if you've ever looked at blown up images of the spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi, it's a spiral shaped virus, or a spirochete, it's not a virus. And um, also syphilis is the same shape. So I haven't found any research that points to its use for uh, treating those things, but I would definitely think about looking into that because of this doctrine of signatures. Um, so this, the medicinal action so far has been attributed to its alkaloids. Another alkaloid is uh, nicotine that you're probably all familiar with, and caffeine is an alkaloid. Uh, this plant, as I said, is native to West Africa, I think specifically Ghana. It's also known as Ghanaian quinine. Uh, it's the root bark that's used medicinally, and it's used to treat malaria. And now it's being used by herbalists to treat MRSA. Okay, so besides taking plant drugs, we can do a tremendous amount just by strengthening the terrain. And this has a lot to do with prebiotics and probiotics. Also demulsants, which are herbs that actually soothe the mucosa if it's flame, inflamed. And then astringents, which work to tighten the, the barrier, like the epithelial lining. So your gut you know, has tiny cells that are like this. And when you get inflammation, they actually separate to allow the white blood cells to come in. But when they separate, it basically leads to a potential sepsis. So if you have a lot of bacteria that's not being controlled, it can enter the bloodstream more easily if there's inflammation. So you want to be taking astringents, which basically keep things really tight and keep uh, bacteria from infiltrating. And you want it to be cool, not inflamed, and you want it to be heavily populated. Heavily populated means you want to have a lot of good bacteria. And you also want to have pre Biotics, which feed the good bacteria. Okay, so I think I've gone over this before, but basically these are all the, the parts of your body that you have microflora colonization. The nose, the mouth, the skin, the small intestine, the lungs, the stomach, the colon, the rectum, and then the vagina. So we are actually only 10% mammalian cells. 90%, like if you counted the actual number of cells that make up the human body, 90% of those cells are bacteria. Yeah. Our cells are bigger. <laughs> What's that? Our cells are bigger, though. They are bigger, but By there's... weight, we're about there's, half <laughs> But there's less of them. So what happens to us if we start killing off that bacteria? Right? Okay, so gut flora, just focusing on gut flora, even though it's in a lot of other places, we have seven to 10 pounds in our colon normally. Uh, it's constantly changing depending on antibiotic use, diet, stress levels, probiotic ingestion, prebiotics, the environment we grew up in, and then also how we were born. Like the cesarean rates right now are through the roof. In New York City, 50% of people who are born in New York City are birthed through cesarean. That's crazy. It's crazy because through the birth canal, we are priming our immune systems. If we don't, if we're not receiving that flora from our mother's 
birth canal, then we're just like <coughs> totally skipping this whole beginning of our immune system. The same thing with breast milk. I saw my nephew born. It was insane that they wanted to give him a hepatitis B shot before they allowed him to start breastfeeding from his mother. That's crazy. Breast milk has colostrum that comes out before the milk does. This is the second way that our immune system is primed. The third way our immune system is primed is by getting dirty as kids. So it's also insane that we're just like totally covering our kids in antibiotics and like antimicrobials. It's like the first time you get an ear infection at like one year old, they want to give them antibiotics. It's just totally insane. Like really, we need to wake up. This is crazy. Okay, so uh, bacteria, just to extend how <laughs> amazing they are, uh, they have two to four million genes, which is about 50 to 100 times the human genetic makeup. So genetically, they are way more diverse than we are. I'm going to talk a little bit about UTIs because Patrick was telling me this is kind of like an up and coming thing, people getting these uh, antibiotic resistant UTI infections. And I have a lot of sympathy for that. It just sounds like a really horrible experience. Um, so when you take antibiotics, they're affecting all of your organs. So even if you're taking antibiotics for like a gut infection, it's going to wipe out the natural bacteria that exists in your bladder and in your urethra. So you want your urethra to be 